You're listening to the Cyberwire Network, powered by N2K. Hi there. Sam Meisenberg from N2K here, inviting you to join me for a brand new monthly segment that you can find right here in the Cyberwire Daily called Learning Layer. Cybersecurity is a constantly changing field, and you need to evolve with it. That means you'll need to acquire new skills and new knowledge. Join me as we learn how to learn in the cybersecurity space. On Learning Layer, we'll be chatting about everything from how to improve technical skills to certification exam prep to brain science. Happy learning. I'll see you in the layer. Are you frustrated with cyber risk scores backed by mysterious data, zero context, and cloudy reasoning? Typical cyber ratings are ineffective, and the true risk story is begging to be told. It's time to cut the BS. Black Kite believes in seeing the full picture with more than a score, one where companies have complete clarity in their third-party cyber risk using reliable, quantitative data. Make better decisions. Reduce your uncertainty. Trust Black Kite. Telecopia and the rise of commodified fishing kits. The Lazarus Group finds new malware. Implications of China's campaign against vulnerable Barracuda appliances. Author Bilko Ransomware's targeting and low extortion demands. Malek Ben Salem from Accenture outlines generative AI implications to spam detection. Jeff Welgan, Chief Learning Officer at N2K Networks, unpacks the NICE framework and strategic workforce intelligence. And a new hacktivist group emerges and takes a particular interest in NATO members. I'm Dave Bittner with your CyberWire Intel Briefing for Friday, August 25th, 2023. ESET describes Telecopia, an easy-to-use Telegram bot that allows unskilled cybercriminals to launch scams. ESET says, We were able to detect several versions of Telecopia, suggesting continuous development. All of these versions are used to create phishing web pages and send phishing email and SMS messages. In addition, some versions of Telecopia can store victim data, usually card details or email addresses, on disk where the bot is run. The toolkit can automatically create phishing pages based on information entered by the scammer. The phishing web pages are designed to mimic different payment and bank login sites, credit or debit card payment gateways, or simply payment pages of different websites. Telecopia caters to Rusophone buyers in the C2C market. So, Telecopia is a spear phishing kit. Our Anglophone listeners might well think that it's based on tele, as in telephone, or telegram, and copy, as in photocopy. Turns out it's not. It's a Russian portmanteau of telegram and the Russian word for spearhead, copia. So, the tip of the spear. The purveyors of telecopia call its targets mammoths, and so ESET, following the same logic, Call the users Neanderthals, since presumably mammoths would have been hunted and speared by those wily Neanderthals back in the day. But somehow we doubt that ESET intends it as a compliment. ESET says most of these Neanderthals work from Russia, followed by some Russophones who operate from Ukraine and Uzbekistan. Cisco Talos has discovered a new remote-access Trojan collection rat that's being used by North Korea's Lazarus Group. Talos says, Collection Rat consists of a variety of standard rat capabilities, including the ability to run arbitrary commands and manage files on the infected endpoint. The implant consists of a packed Microsoft Foundation class library based Windows binary that decrypts and executes the actual malware code on the fly. 
Malware developers like using MFC even though it's a complex, object-oriented wrapper. MFC, which traditionally is used to create Windows applications, user interfaces, controls, and events, allows multiple components of malware to seamlessly work with each other while abstracting the inner implementations of the Windows OS from the authors. The researchers also observe that Lazarus Group appears to be changing its tactics, increasingly relying on open-source tools and frameworks in the initial access phase of their attacks, as opposed to strictly employing them in the post-compromise phase. New tricks for an old dog. The U.S. FBI has released an alert warning that Barracuda's email security gateway appliances remain vulnerable to compromise by suspected Chinese government threat actors. The FBI states, The cyber actors utilize this vulnerability to insert malicious payloads onto the ESG appliance with a variety of capabilities that enabled persistent access, email scanning, credential harvesting, and data exfiltration. The FBI strongly advises all affected ESG appliances be isolated and replaced immediately, and all networks scanned for connections to the provided list of indicators of compromise immediately. Nettenrich is tracking a new variant of malware belonging to the Bilka ransomware family, active since August 1, 2023. The ransomware targets individuals and small businesses, and tells victims to visit a Tor-based portal to open a ticket for negotiations. The attackers demand between $800 and $1,600 for the decryption key. The researchers note, The ransomware operator appears unwilling to negotiate, holding firm on the initial demand for decryption keys. The operator would not provide a decrypted sample screenshot to the victim directly, but instead provided one on an image hosting service. This confirms there is a working decryptor present within the group. They seem to have flown under the radar by hitting smaller businesses and making relatively low ransom demands. And finally, there seems to be a new hacktivist crew operating in cyberspace. Hello, Kitty Sec. Cyberscoop reports being in touch with a hacktivist group that's calling itself Kitten Sec. Kitten Sec says they're a new outfit, although Cyberscoop writes... They acknowledge connections to other hacktivist groups, including ThreatSec and GhostSec. GhostSec is known for an online campaign against Islamic activity it began after 2015's Charlie Hedbo murders in Paris. It's also known to have acted against Russian targets during the present war. It styles itself as an opponent of oppression. ThreatSec positions itself in much the same way. KittenSec says it's an opponent of corruption— Its first target set, hit at the end of July, was Romanian. Since then, it's been active against targets in Greece, France, Chile, Panama, and Italy, but it disclaims any political allegiance and says its operations have nothing to do with Russia's war in Ukraine. The operation against Romania, the group told Cyberscoop, is retaliation against the countries of NATO for their attacks on human rights. Kitten's sec doesn't appear to be financially motivated, Many hacktivist groups are fronts for state intelligence services, and Kittensec's particular animus against NATO suggests the possibility of a Russian connection, although that remains a matter of circumstantial speculation. In any case, keep an eye out for Kittysec, especially if you're in a NATO country. Coming up after the break, Malek Ben Salem from Accenture outlines generative AI implications to spam detection. Jeff Welgan, Chief Learning Officer at N2K Networks, unpacks the NICE framework and strategic workforce intelligence. Stay with us. Tired of cybersecurity mega conferences? MWISE is different. With a focused agenda and targeted problem solving, MWISE is where security's best go to get better. From September 18th through the 20th in Washington, D.C., you'll join a special community of security's sharpest minds, hear perspectives you might not get anywhere else, and reach a new level of mastery that'll prepare you for what's next. Register early and save at mwise.mandiant.com slash conf23. 
That's mwise.mandiant.com forward slash C-O-N-F-2-3. And now, a word from our sponsor, SpyCloud, the cybercrime analytics leader. SpyCloud disrupts cybercrime by telling you what criminals know about your business and your customers, so you can take action to prevent ransomware, session hijacking, account takeover, and online fraud. SpyCloud constantly recaptures and analyzes new data from the criminal underground, including credentials, session cookies, and PII siphoned from malware-infected devices. With knowledge of the specific exposed data criminals have in hand from InfoStealer malware on managed and unmanaged devices, security teams can respond with a more efficient and effective process called post-infection remediation that fits seamlessly into existing incident response frameworks. Get SpyCloud's post-infection remediation guide outlining the seven steps for preventing a malware infection from becoming a full-blown ransomware incident. Visit spycloud.com slash cyberwire. That's spycloud.com slash cyberwire. And we thank SpyCloud for sponsoring our show. And it is my pleasure to welcome to the show one of my N2K colleagues, our chief learning officer, Jeff Welgan. Jeff, welcome. Hey, Dave. Thanks. Thanks for having me on the show. You know, one of the things that uh, I was really excited about when the CyberWire merged with CyberVista and we and we became N2K Networks was having access to all of the uh, learning facilities and expertise that you all have on the CyberVista side of things. And today we're going to take advantage of that. I, I want to talk to you today about uh, the NICE framework uh, and how folks can implement that and, and really expand on it as well. Can we start off with some high-level stuff here for folks who might not be familiar with it? Can you describe NICE for us? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So so NICE actually is an acronym that stands for the National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education. It sits within the Department of Commerce under NIST. So they have created uh, a while back, it was sometime around 2010, the earlier workings were around 2008, cybersecurity workforce framework to address these issues that that we see day to day in in this industry related to what the heck are the job roles what's expected out of job roles and how do we actually create a framework around that for employers well let's dig into that i mean how how do people both on the government side and in the private sector typically come at implementing this nice framework yeah so i think one of the big challenges that nice was addressing when they put out the framework was that they, they needed a common lexicon for the industry. Um, as, you, as I'm sure you are well aware, Dave, that it's when you go out into the market, uh, you can call a SOC analyst. There's a number of different job titles for that. So they wanted to normalize just work role titles, particularly for the government side, just so they can kind of organize the workforce in a way that made sense um, with different you know uh, job identification codes, et cetera. So that's re- really where it started. And then I think um, as such, they really needed to identify, well, what, what are the expectations for those work roles? Like what knowledge, skills, abilities, tasks uh, are, are required for those? So if you ever hear the term KSATs, that's kind of where that term came out of those mm-hmm. knowledge, skills, abilities, and tasks. That's since evolved to like TKS statements, tasks, knowledge, and skills. So they're constantly playing around with it and tweaking it and making improvements to it. And so for folks who are using it as, a, as an organizing framework here, I mean, how do they typically come at that? How, how, do, they, how do they measure success? Yeah, I think um, it really comes down to, I think, a lot of our, uh, commercial entities that are leveraging it use that for job classifications, just trying to organize the, the workforce. So it becomes part of a human capital strategy uh, related to how do we title these uh, particular job roles, and what are the expectations for those people in those roles when we're trying to do talent acquisition? Now, there are challenges to that. Uh, leveraging the, the the NICE framework for one for one can be challenging because people who kind of are familiar with it, as you examine some of the work roles that they've identified in there, they don't always match up one to one to what commercial entities would actually call a work mm-hmm. role. 
for example, I mentioned SOC analyst. I say SOC analyst, everybody knows what a SOC analyst is. If you put that out as a job rack on an Indeed or whatever your, your uh, talent acquisition recruitment tool is, people who in, in those fields kind of are drawn to that. NICE actually defines that work role as a cyber defense analyst. Okay, you can kind of make the connection, but it's not necessarily something that's as common in, in the commercial industry to see cyber defense analysts versus a SOC analyst. So I think that's one of the drawbacks of the framework, although it is also one of those things they're trying to solve for because of that problem of job titling and the variations of job titles that exist for certain professions. What about it expanding beyond the NICE framework? Are folks using it as, as a foundational element and then going beyond that, fine-tuning it to their own organizations? You see a range, right? The earliest adoption of it, the folks are just kind of dabbling with it. A lot of times they're just doing a one-for-one matchup. Okay, these job titles kind of line up to this work role per NICE, and it's a, a straight line. Organizations that are a little bit more familiar with it may actually go a little bit further and start looking at some of the, the KSAs or TKS statements or actually looking at the competencies that are defined within NICE to kind of align those two work roles. At N2K, we kind of go above and beyond all of that to kind of say, you know what, job roles are pretty unique at companies. You know, uh, you know a software engineer at J.P. Morgan Chase may be a little bit different than the, the regional bank. Right. So Hmm. the hats you wear at those organizations can vary significantly from company to company. So what we want to do is not necessarily lean in on just the work roles and the predefined list of KSAs or TKS statements. We want to work with customers and say, okay, well, what does your software engineer look like there? What do you expect for that particular work role? And above and beyond NICE, we want to actually define like proficiency levels of those work roles because NICE does not say, oh, you know, you need to understand encryption, subject matter expertise mastery or beginner level mastery. They, they do not do that work. Um, so at N2K, we kind of do that with our customers. We want to say, okay, sure, encryption is important, but how important is it to the work role? And we will quantify that for, for our customers. So it's a matter of establishing where people are in their educational journey of expertise and then figuring out where they need to go as well? That's right. That's right. There's also one other thing that that we've done at N2K to kind of account for some of these, what I would call nuances or gaps within the framework to help it translate a little bit better for the commercial world. The, the structure of the NICE framework with these seven categories and 33 specialty areas, I feel are, are very much like putting a, a work role into a box and you're pigeonholed into that box, at least definitionally. What we've done is we've created another layer, a taxonomy on top of NICE that we've mapped to. So we've created these, what we call functional tags, 14 functional tags or groups that are a little bit more common in or in line with what you would see from a, a team structure within cybersecurity at any organization. So we've created things like analysis and analytics or cyber defensive operations or GRC or leadership and IT, you know, IT and cyber leadership. That way it, it kind of translates a little bit better to the org chart of like, okay, I know I have identity access management analysts here. They fit in within that functional team, right? So they fit in that functional group. And on our back end, we've kind of done the mapping back to NICE to kind of say, hey, this is how it maps back to the NICE framework. Here are the KSAs or competencies or the specialty areas that associate with those functional groups we've identified. All right. Well, Jeff Welgan is the Chief Learning Officer here at N2K Networks, my colleague. Uh, Jeff, thanks for joining us. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me, Dave. And it is always my pleasure to welcome back to the show Malek Ben Salem. She is Managing Director for Security and Emerging Technology at Accenture. Uh, Malek, great to have you back. You know, those of us who have been in the uh, online world for a long time remember when spam was a terrible, terrible problem. And it seems to me like in the past few years, spam I would consider to be mostly a solved problem. Like, like very little spam makes it through to my email box, but. I know something you and your colleagues have had an eye on is uh, 
this notion that with generative AI, uh, that could change the game when it comes to spam. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so I think, I mean, luckily we've, we've seen that reduction in spam in our inboxes because our abilities to detect spam has, has significantly improved. But with Gen AI, uh, I think the abilities of these cameras are improving because now they have this assistance of generative AI models to produce high quality spam, believable spam. Uh, and therefore, we need to uh, improve our detection capabilities again in order to meet the improvements on the uh, attack side. I've, be, I've seen uh, people saying, uh, you know, we're not going to see, you, you know, those uh, scams or emails that we get that look really like spam, like that, the, that have those spelling mistakes, right? I've seen people throwing out the argument that you know, we're not going to see that anymore because the attackers have Gen AI assistance to them. But others said, no, no, we're, we're going to continue to see that uh, because that's done on purpose. Those spelling mistakes are done on purpose in order to screen the most likely victims to, to these scams, right? So the most gullible people, if you will. Uh, those people will respond to, to those emails even though they, they see that there are spelling mistakes in them. I mean, I don't think that's going to be valid anymore uh, because that argument relies on the how expensive it is for for the scammers to be able to, uh, sorry, to respond to, you know, large numbers of people who fall for those scams, right? You know, once they respond to that first initial contact, the first email, the scammers do not have the resources to continue that conversation with the potential victim, right? Because it requires people to, you know, interact with them. But now that they have AI tools, they can carry on that conversation using automated tools, right? They don't have to spend the resources themselves, the time, the attention, et cetera, to respond individually to these people. Because of that, then, you know, the, the, the trade-offs change or, or the numbers change. Now they're, they're all of a sudden interested in more numbers to respond to them as opposed to, uh, interested in weeding out or screening out the potential victims from that first contact. So what are the options that are available to defenders then to, to adapt to this? So I think that's why we need to emphasize, uh, first of all, uh, you know, rely more on detecting these, rely less on, <laughs> on looking for spelling mistakes in spam to you know, classified as spam. So our spam detectors would have to uh, emphasize more other uh, other features in spam. Um, that's for sure, and, and they're doing so, right? But I'm, I'm saying if, if these are, you know, if if their tools are anomaly detection based tools, they're probably assigning different weights for the different features, and maybe they need to de-emphasize or the types of features that are related to spelling mistakes and emphasize other the weights of other features. And then for, for our security training, this is what I, I think we need to pay attention to. When we do security awareness training for our uh, you know, employees or for the larger population, we need to highlight or emphasize that, understand the entire context, understand uh, you know, who's sending you this email and what they're asking for as opposed to focus on finding spelling mistakes in, in the spam email that you're receiving. I think that has been a key message that we've been providing people before. You know, look for spelling mistakes. That's a bad sign. I don't think, I don't think that we're going to see <laughs> those types of mistakes as, as often in the future. Uh, so we need to focus on other indicators. All right. Well, it's interesting. Uh, the cat and mouse game continues, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, that continues in security uh, all the time. All right. Well, Malek Ben Salem, thank you for joining us. Mm -hmm. 
Meet Mimecast. They're in the business of taking companies at risk of cyber attack and putting them at ease. Picture this. It's Monday morning. You're cruising through hundreds of unread emails. Your impulse to promptly click, download, or respond could be a prompt to launch a cyber attack. An email address is a direct digital path to the mind, the machine, and the data of every person in your organization. It needs better security. I know what you're thinking. I'm all set. I have Microsoft 365 protection, Dave. It might not be enough. That's where Mimecast comes in. They've developed a system that fortifies your email security and reduces costs, risks, and complexities, enabling you and your business to work protected. So before you click your next email, visit Mimecast.com to start your free 30-day trial. And that's the Cyberwire. For links to all of today's stories, check out our daily briefing at thecyberwire.com. Be sure to check out this weekend's Research Saturday and my conversation with Tao Skverer from Asterix Security. We're discussing their work, Ghost Token, exploiting GCP application infrastructure to create invisible, unremovable Trojan app on Google accounts. That's Research Saturday. Check it out. We'd love to know what you think of this podcast. You can email us at cyberwire at n2k.com. Your feedback helps us ensure we're delivering the information and insights that help keep you a step ahead in the rapidly changing world of cybersecurity. We're privileged that N2K and podcasts like The Cyberwire are part of the daily intelligence routine of many of the most influential leaders and operators in the public and private sector, as well as the critical security teams supporting the Fortune 500 and many of the world's preeminent intelligence and law enforcement agencies. N2K Strategic Workforce Intelligence optimizes the value of your biggest investment, your people. We make you smarter about your team while making your team smarter. Learn more at n2k.com. This episode was produced by Liz Irvin and senior producer Jennifer Iben. Our mixer is Trey Hester with original music by Elliot Peltzman. The show was written by our editorial staff. Our executive editor is Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening. We'll see you back here next week. We'll be right back. 